But still, we're losing the argument with the, with the people who should be the core base of the Green Movement. But why is that? But sometimes certain things require time. People want short-term solutions, immediate solutions, something which they can do right here, right now. But some people told us, eh, but you are, you are a bit uh, too harsh with your Green Deal. Maybe we could change this or change that. But I don't think that the country, the, the world, can uh, afford these uh, tweaks here and there. So the way I speak, the way I uh, project myself, is of somebody who actually cares. To go also stand as a member for the European Parliament. Yes. What on earth possessed you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I like challenges. I think that the importance of sticking to environmental issues uh, overarches everything else. We still fight for human rights, for equality, yes, why not? But I think the importance of climate change at the moment is the top priority even at, on a European level. In the long term, it's the planet and us which will benefit from it. Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell and welcome to Season 3 of Conversations on Climate. Sandra, thank you so much for taking the time out of your enormously busy schedule to sit down and have a conversation. Thank you for inviting me. It's my absolute pleasure. So uh, to begin with, um, can you introduce yourself, um, your background and your, your position um, within the, the Green Party here in Malta? So I'm Sandra Gauci. I'm a teacher by day and for the rest of the day, I'm the leader of the Green Party here in Malta. Um, I've been the leader almost a year now and I've been active in the party for three years. Um, it is a challenge here in Malta to be the leader of a third party because uh, uh, there's, the, the electoral system doesn't help much. But uh, I'm up to that challenge and I think the time is ripe for the people also to uh, have a third voice in, in Parliament and that is what I'm working on. Um, basically I spend a lot of time with teenagers so from them I get a feel of what's going on and what needs to be done and uh, they are practically keep me with my foot, my feet close to the ground. Okay, fantastic. And how does your working with young people on a daily basis help your, your climate awareness and how has it moulded your politics? Well, it's young people who actually uh, give me the ideas and uh, what needs to be done. For example, uh, we have groups at a school which called, it's called Ecoscola where they work in, in a field in the school and they uh, come up with ideas about how to preserve water and uh, to see with which, what types of bees are there, what are, if they are missing. So that is something which keeps them uh, close to the environment and then they refer to me <laughs> what they find, find out. Also the fact that they notice that there's a lot uh, less greenery than before. I mean, in Malta we have less than 1% of greenery. That is something which is very worrisome for the young generation because they believe that they, they don't have anywhere to uh, relax and unwind without paying any money. So uh, they tell me, oh, oh, miss, uh, it's like wherever we go, if we want to enjoy ourselves, we need to pay the entry fee, we need to pay to use whatever. So that is something which is a big concern for the young people. So they end up enclosed in their houses, uh, looking at their mobile, even though they wanted to do something else. And that is something which we need to work upon. Perfect. And uh, d was there a moment where you decided that you really wanted to get involved in, in politics? Well, th the moment happened like six years ago. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of uh, things going on in Malta. There, there was the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And there, was a, there were a lot of protests to make the prime minister resign. And uh, that kind of, you know, lit up something in me, mainly anger at how things were going on. And I thought, uh, it's time that I do something. I cannot keep seeing these politicians make, taking the people for a, for a ride. And I started uh, this uh, satirical program called ABS News six years ago. And uh, it was something quite unusual for the Maltese because uh, here in Malta, the politicians are sacred cows. You don't make fun of them. You don't joke about them. You put them uh, on a table, you, you light up a candle, I've seen this, and uh, you treat them like demigods. But there I was on my sofa, because that's how I do it, <laughs> a sofa and the mobile on a stand, and there I was 
cracking jokes about them, ridiculing them because they deserve to, because they were making fun of the people. So I thought, okay, I will make fun of them. And that's where it all started. Then uh, after three years, I thought that I wanted to do a bit more. So I joined uh, the Green Party and uh, I joined as vice chair. I got uh, to know how a party works because I had uh, no idea how things were working. And uh, I got also the respect of the people in the committee through my hard work and being consistent. And then uh, a year after that, uh, over two years, I became uh, the leader of the Green Party here in Malta. And I'm also the third woman leader in the history of Malta, just to give you an idea how women and politics are towards apart, sadly. And that's the thing I'm very proud of, and hopefully I will inspire more women to get into politics. And you've, you've picked an extremely big job. Yeah. Uh, like green politics in Malta, like uh, any kind of look down the league tables of uh, renewables penetration shows, Malta is the bottom of the European Union's league table for for uh, amount of renewables in the energy system. And I yeah. just saw we um, here recently um, commissioned or approved the commissioning of a new diesel uh, generator yeah. as part part of the the infrastructure. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, the history and the uh, the culture behind the the attitude towards energy and how we ended up in in this situation here. Well, we ended up in this situation because of, co of corruption mainly. We had the electrogas scandal, and then we ended up uh, with uh, corruption upon corruption and not having long-term planning for different sources of energy. Then uh, last summer, we had uh, these blackouts, which lasted days, sometimes even over a week in certain parts of Malta, and which brought Malta to a halt because people had to spend July in this 40 degrees Celsius without any, uh, any AC, any nothing. So, and people got angry about it. We were the only party who actually protested against the way uh, uh, energy is being used and abused and how there was so, so much short-term planning for uh, using renewables and uh, different sources of energy. The, this government didn't, uh, invest into renewables. In fact, we are dishing out one million a day on fuel, which, which could be invested into uh, renewables, which we're not doing. It's like there is this allergy towards renewables. But personally, I think because you cannot uh, dip your finger much when it comes to renewables, what with, what with another power station here and uh, an interconnector there. So, so how with an interconnector was there, tra was there, there blackouts? Like surely the, the interconnector is the resilience. Like what, what, what happened there? And, and, and overdose of uh, requests uh, for energy and the uh, distribution system wasn't up to that request. During the la past five years in Malta, we had a, a huge influx of migrants and the uh, infrastructure when it comes to even electricity distribution wasn't up to, didn't match to the number of people we imported so the the demand was way more huge than the supply could get so we had substations exploding fires here and there and this uh, second interconnector for me is a joke because it will make us depend on another country which still uses fossil fuels instead of polluting here we'll pollute there and will, will make us again dependent on foreigners. I mean, our, uh, our, our power station is in the hands of the Chinese. So we'll have the uh, interconnector in the hands of the Sicilians. What, what is it we have now? We'll become dependent on others. Interesting. Okay, so you're obviously very frustrated with the system as it stands. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, but one of your one of the, your kind of your key party messages is a wish to reform the system. What? How do you? How do? You, what would you like to see? What changes would you like to see? Oh well, there are a lot of changes to start from. Well, definitely we need a reform in the electoral system to change things, because uh, one thing that people tell us: oh, you'll never get elected. It's pointless voting for you because the electoral system here is uh, promotes more the, the bipartisan way of having two parties and not having a third voice. Bec the island is divided into 13 districts when there is a general election and you have to reach a quota to get elected. Usually it's around 3,500. It changes according to how many people vote. 
And up till now, we never had the chance to have uh, one person reach that quota. Also, to add up to this, uh, to having more restrictions, uh, before the previous general election, they came out with this gender quota, which is nothing but a top up, where uh, to, they said to promote more women into politics. They decided that the, um, they, the, the first six uh, uh, women um, candidates from the Labour Party and from the PN who got the most votes would automatically get into the parliament without even being elected. I mean, there's a member of parliament there with 150 votes. But this top up did it include any third parties. So it was for specific women. Women like me, who didn't fall under the red or the blue, were automatically cut out. So we have, uh, as a party, we have a, a case in court, which has been going on for almost two years now, where we are challenging this gender quota, but also the way the electoral system is uh, keeping us out from the parliament. Because there is this uh, law, uh, the proportionate law, and according to the proportionate law, since we got 4,747 uh, votes in the last election, it's like a seat and a half. So we are fighting for that. And one of the, the, the practical goals uh, that, that your party has is trying to reinvigorate engagements with young people. Like, yes, I think in, in the climate movement, we all, we all see you know, the next generation of the future. That's why we're doing this, uh, because you know, we need to be leaving a legacy, leaving, leaving a future for, for our children, our children's children and uh, future generations. Now, there's, there's got to be some challenges there. Like, how do you, yes. go, how do you go about kind of winning new voters, but also winning back people who are, are, are part of other climate movements, like to, towards kind of politics? So when it comes to youth, to, to winning over youth, I've revived the youth sec section in my party, which was a bit dormant, especially with COVID, etc. But now I have a, an up and running youth section, which is also working in places like the university, MCAS, junior college, and from there we enroll new faces. It's not easy, eh? it's not easy. I mean, young people have their commitments, their life is way harder than it was back in my age, but uh, through the people who I have on the ground, uh, we're, they're doing good work. At least I can get the invites and get to talk to them. I can get, get to go to university, I get to go to the sixth forms there, and they get to know me. And from there, we have at least members getting in. And I'm very proud of the numbers of members which have joined us uh, in the past year. And uh, that's, that's proving uh, very uh, hopeful for me. Well, what uh, type of uh, messaging do you find most useful and most, that, that resonates most with young people that you've, you've been talking to? Definitely actions which are a bit like, uh, let's say, dramatic. And uh, also the use of the words, the powerful words, which resonate with the young people. I think people, young people definitely want somebody who is, who reflects their anger. They're fed up of these uh, people who are too cushy, even at the opposition, with what is going on. So the way I speak, the way I uh, project myself, is of somebody who actually cares and is angry not because of some issue, but is angry because she wants things better than they are. So that thing resonates with young people because they are the, the, the most who are getting uh, less chances in the world. I mean, in Malta, I mean, they have to leave Malta because they're not finding uh, homes affordable enough. Sometimes they can't find jobs because there's a lot of cronyism going on and they know that whatever they studied for, there's, there's not a meritocracy in this country, so they're fed up of it. There's not enough law enforcement. There's impunity wherever you look. These are things which actually uh, irritate a lot the young people. Also the fact, yes, that the government doesn't take care of uh, uh, the issues of global warming, of the environment with construction going here and there. Now they want to build uh, uh, with the with the blessing of the government over Arab land in Zurich. And we were the only party who spoke against it. So, I mean, uh, we're, we're like David and Goliath, but I'm not, I'm not giving up. Mm -hmm. Well, 
We know how the David and Goliath story ends. And you've got an interesting take, which is that you believe the future of the Green Party, not just here, but globally, should be within the working class. Yes. Now, that's interesting because the context of certain, in, certainly in Europe, has been a view that green movements and green policies are contrary to the interests of the working class. So they say it's like that's the messaging of the Gilets Jaunes, that's the messaging of Just Stop Oil, that's the messaging of uh, of the, uh, the the farmers' protest. That that yeah. green policies impact negatively impact working class people. How do we reclaim environmentalism from the you know elitist versus the worker and uh, critique? by explaining to the people the real impact and making it practical in a way that people understand it. For example, when it comes to the farmers, when I spoke to the farmers here in Malta, what they uh, are against uh, is the uh, competition which, is, which isn't on the same playing, le playing field. If, the, if you are a farmer in Europe, but then the government imports a lot of uh, fruit and vegetables from uh, countries which are outside Europe, which do not have the same standards which we have, that irritates them a lot. So we need to um, be more uh, careful with what we import. And yes, if needs be, tax what we import from outside of the EU. And also expect a certain standards from countries which for now they do not have. If you want to deal with us, yes, you have to reach our standards. Because in Europe, that's what we, we, we're working on. When it comes to uh, some people t saying that the Green Party is a kind of elitist, whatever. I think that if you have a party which is working on a living income, uh, when you have a party which is uh, working on uh, human rights, these are the things which, at the end of the day, are things which the working class is facing every day. The working class is the one which gets the backlash when it comes to uh, environmental challenges if there's a lack of water, if there is a, a drought going on, like we're going to have in Sicily this summer. I've read that they're going to have like a water every four or five days. So that will be impact definitely the people who are at the lower strata of the uh, society. These are things which uh, we need to break, because sometimes they impose on us greens, some thing, things which aren't on us, which aren't us. So we need to show them that this is the green deal. Which, which isn't as bad as they think. Yeah, no, no, I fully agree. But um, how are we losing this argument? Like, to me, it's, it, it makes in just incredible amounts of sense that it is going to be the working class who are the most impacted by the negative, negative effects of climate change. Like, um, the wealthier you are, the more ability you have to pay for air conditioning, the more ability you have to pay for water, the more ability you have, you have to, to move away from, from um, nasty environments. But yet we're still losing the arguments. And yet the protests are out in the streets calling the, the green movements the bad guys. And, also, and even in, in the case of agriculture, mm -hmm. where, agriculture, where it is the, the green movement who are saying we need to be providing more supports to farmers. But still, we're losing the argument with the, with the people who should be the core base of the green movement. But why is that? Because well, sometimes certain things require time. People want short-term solutions, immediate solutions, something which they can do right here, right now. When it comes to planning certain things, you need time to get there. And uh, that is something which is a, a bit counterproductive for because people are angry now. People are, <laughs> are, 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 are worried now, are hungry now. But in certain ex aspects, especially of the Green Day, you have to, to, to plan uh, through some time. And that is something which, yes, sometimes works against us. But in the long term, it's the planet and us which will benefit from it. Um I just wonder if you think that there might be, if there might be a danger in couching the green arguments as a, um, a in, in the left or in the right. Because mm -hmm. there's one thing that historically, and I know it's far less so these days, but historically the green movement has been very good at being bipartisan. Like everybody living on the same sky, and you'd have for different reasons, yes, yeah. but both, but both, both ends of the political spectrum, you know, supporting largely supportive of, of green of green stuff. Um, now we've seen kind of more of a lurch towards the uh, the left for, for for green policies, and we may end up like. Do you see a danger of us of perhaps going too far in that direction, and be, where green becomes red, and then you automatically end up pushing away a, a, a portion of the electorate who are just instinctively anti-red and and, and pro-blue. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, if you see the European Greens, we have a touch of red because after all certain social issues, we cannot ignore them. I think that the importance of sticking to environmental issues uh, overarches everything else. We still have, we, we still fight for human rights, for equality, yes, why not? But I think the importance of climate change at the moment is the top priority even at, on a European level. Another point that you, you make very well is that you think that uh, green parties and green politics should be um, potential parties of government and not NGOs. You know, yes. we should, shouldn't be acting, acting like NGOs. Now, the difficulty with that argument is that the green agenda is so difficult to be pulling off. Like it is, it is really to, to try and, and transform an economy, mm -hmm. and to try and transform actually the, the planet, the entire the entire ecosystem yeah. to to be genuinely sustainable. Does is it's hard to do it without having some form of of policies that a lot of people won't like. How do you get the green messaging into something that can be a winning message in the ballot box? Well. We definitely need to take care of our planet. Um, I know it's not an easy task to, uh, to, to pass over because uh, people want the here and now, want the money, and sometimes what we say isn't very uh, popular because sometimes it requires some sacrifice. But we need, I believe that we need to leave a better planet. We're seeing the effects of global warming right around us. I mean, we're having here in Malta at least temperatures which back 10 years ago we didn't have. But when I was young, I mean, a heat wave was 30, 35. Now it's 45, 50. So we, people can remember these things. It's not like something from 100 years ago. We're seeing um, the sea is, is becoming warmer. So we are actually seeing it with our own eyes, the changes. And we need to, uh, to break these changes which are happening because of the global warming. We are not just for the uh, environment. We also uh, open up to uh, social issues. We speak about uh, the abuse happening in the construction industry. We speak about human rights. We speak about equality. And uh, we were, we're always there near the, uh, near the people, with the people, which isn't always that easy, as, as easy as it seems. But when you are free to speak, when you aren't in the pocket of anyone, yes, you can actually say things as they are. And that is something which we are doing. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's really interesting thing I've seen in the climate movement over the last 10 years or so. It's, it's, it has the singular focus on one molecule being carbon that that's that was obsessing the climate movement for 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 years um has has, has faded a bit and more and and bigger issues like the, the just transition issue and uh, you know fairness equality rights has all been part been part of this you know a a, a transformed future from with an energy system has been tried uh, been forward to have uh, been changed into a transformed system for a sustainable planet which is like is a very important uh, distinction to make because even if we solve the climate problem, we if we don't solve biodiversity issues, if we don't, we'll just find other ways of destroying our planets. Yes, <laughs> yes we're quite creative at that. But I think um, we need to start, especially here in Malta, a, a real um, uh, serious policy about uh, changing the way we produce our energy. And uh, yes, we need to invest in that. From what I'm seeing, sadly, that's not the way the country is going, because, as you said, we're into getting another fossil fuel power station and etc. But I still believe that that's the way to go. And we, it, it has, it's the government, again, which has to be the, the leader in these things, because if you have a, a, a low-income family, it's the government which needs to help them to move from, uh, to, to get solar panels, to get photovoltaic. We used to have uh, subsidies on these things, but uh, uh, I think they phased out. And also, it, it, needs, it needs to lead the way, which isn't, it isn't doing. So it's still being, uh, putting forward things which are obsolete for me. Because I mean, if you're putting forward again, the use of diesel, for me, you're not a forward thinker person, you're thinking backwards. 
and that is something which the country will pay dearly for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, policy sets the, sets the tone in any country. Yes. Uh, without, uh, even if you have a look at, say, the example of the difference between, say, England and Scotland, mm -hmm. and just, just a, di a different policy, um, yes. really relating just to planning law fundamentally, has just transformed. So Scotland's energy uh, system is, it can do, it, like it's 105 or 108 percent renewables. So it, it exports energy, it produces produces more than it needs. And the UK, spare, there were more wind turbines, significantly more wind turbines built in the Ukraine last year than there were in England. Oh. In a, it's the middle of a war. Yes, they just, managed. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, they managed. And because of, of, of unhelpful planning policy in England, nothing got built. Yeah, yes, essentially yes. nothing got built. So it's you know, policy sets the thing very, very much. Definitely. And they affect the people's health. Because we have uh, skyrocketed the use of inhaler, inhalers here in Malta and the problems, respiratory, respiratory problems that we have. And uh, it's, become, it's, it's getting uh, out of control. But no one seems to care that we're paying with our health this lack of policy when it comes to renewable energy. But people are realizing, because they are noticing it on themselves, on their own health, that, hey, I wasn't using an inhaler up to a year ago. What's happened to me? I wasn't asthmatic. Now, why, am I, why need to, I need to, to buy an inhaler? Why do I have respiratory problems? Why do I have to go to hospital to use an air machine? And they are living it on their own skin. And that is getting the message home. Because uh, they know that they weren't like that, they weren't born like that, but it's because of the quality of the air, which is very poor. And many, m most of it is because of the uh, huge use of cars and also um, um, factories here and there, which are, are not as regulated as they should be and are affecting the quality of the air of the surrounding towns. Mm -hmm. And are there, is there kind of noticeable kind of like is there kind of scientific evidence that shows that air quality is 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 deteriorating in, in Malta? There have been some studies which show that yes and uh, they've showed that in Malta even European studies that show that in Malta the, the air quality is very bad in fact you see like a black, black dot in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, it's interesting to see like your your policies are, are, are very broad it's like and again it goes back to the theme of uh, you thinking that the, the Green Party should be seen as parties of government with policies that cover more than just just singular issues. Um, but. I'm just curious because it, uh, it's something of uh, personal interest to me. Um, you have a policy on artificial intelligence. Um, yes. Just wondering, like, wh wh what was the thing? Why did you think it was important, sufficiently important, to have a policy on on AI as, as first place? And what is your stance on, on on its role in that transformation? Well, technology is with us, and we cannot ignore the importance of AI. So we look forward to using AI as much as possible, even to create new jobs. Because sometimes people are afraid of AI. There's because they think that they will lose jobs, but we believe that it will create jobs, jobs of quality, which are high paid, and that is where we should invest. We should invest more in technology than in building up towers. Definitely, then that's the way forward. I think uh, as like any transformation, it will be have its challenges, but I think it will be a positive one, um, especially for, not only for the country, but also for the quality of life of people. So uh, you're clearly not busy enough because <laughs> you decided in terms of like you'd be up with your, your role in the Green Party and also your, your full time job to go also stand as a member for the European Parliament. Yes. What on earth possessed you to do that? <laughs> I, 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 I like challenges and uh, since um, with our electoral system, I, never, I don't stand a chance for now to get elected through for a general election, I thought, well, during the MEP elections, we don't have any districts. Let's see what's go what, what happens. And yes, it's a lot of work because you have to knock doors from north to south of the country. But I believe that people are understanding my message, are trusting me, which is a big deal at this point in time, because there is a lot of disenchantment when it comes to politicians and politics here in Malta. And, uh, People appreciate hard workers. When they see people working, they know that they can vote to that person. I'm seeing uh, some sort of maturity going on because uh, even the elector, the people are in a change. They are changing, and that change will bring 
I think something positive even for the Green Party. So let's see on the 8th of June what will happen. Now clearly the European Union has been leading the way really globally in, in, in green policies like cross-border carbon charges, uh, sustainability directives for disclosures. What impact would you like to have when you enter Parliament? Well, definitely I will uh, work on when it, when, it, when it comes to living income because it's very important to me. I believe in an equal society. So as long as we have people who uh, cannot live with what they're earning or they're being underpaid, I don't think that we have an equal Europe. So that is one of the things uh, I work upon. Also, um, uh, the uh, effect of pollution, we need to be consistent with the Green Deal and work on uh, the effect of pollution, on, which, which is heavy on our health and, and uh, put forward what is written in the Green Deal, because I think it will benefit all of us. Also, I think um, if we could work to have uh, an animal commissioner, which would be a person in charge of animal rights, uh, it would be something different. And I know how people uh, have animals close to their heart and they uh, love their pets. But I believe that if we have an, a European uh, policy which safeguards the, uh, the rights of animals and with a person actually in charge of it, it will give more strength to the policy we, policies we already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic idea. Yeah, really bad. I mean, they want uh, a, a commissioner for defense, so why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, there's a danger in this uh, coming set of European elections that the majority of support of green uh, green initiatives that has been you know, present in, in Parliament for, for quite some time might, might be lost. Um, why do you think that is? And um, how do you think that kind of green movements around Europe should be trying to, to, to make the, the counter arguments? Well, one of the problems is the rise of the right across Europe. So they are uh, challenging our policies and uh, the populist uh, approach they are, they, are, they are using is sadly working, but we need to focus on our aims as, uh, we, as they have them. We cannot uh, compromise on what we already have, because I believe that that's the way to go. And being uh, strong in what we believe in without compromising on certain things. Because some people told us, eh, but you are, you are a bit... Uh, too harsh with your Green Deal, maybe we could change this or change that. But I don't think that the country, the, the world can uh, afford these tweaks here and there. So we need to continue exposing our arguments to the people and showing them the long term benefits which it will have on the country and on themselves. Yet one of the kind of common critiques of green policies is that they're too complicated. Like it's it's too it's too hard for people to explain. You can't get it across in a "Make America Great Again," let's get Brexit done in a in, in a kind of in a, in a simple form of messaging um, that you know let's dump the green crap. Like it's because what we are talking about is systemic. It is difficult. It is. Um, we're talking about global tipping points. We're talking about uh, complicated long-term reactions in our environments that causes all sorts of uh, crises over over decades and generations. Um, while the messaging from the from from the other side is very simple. It's about um, you know expense. It's about your next month's bill. It isn't. It's 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 much easier to to to, to elaborate on. Um, if you could get a couple of just simple messages out. Into, into the kind of the, you know, the, the kind of the general populace. What, what, what would they be? Well, <laughs> um, when you think about it, I mean, what we're planning is a, a bit uh, long term. So yes, I understand that sometimes people don't uh, don't get it. But um, if I had to choose uh, right now, <laughs> like vote green uh, for your future. Um, green for uh, for the planet because uh, if we continue with this way i mean we won't have another planet uh, our children will not have any future i mean we're seeing even climate migrants because of the drought in certain countries so it's time that uh, we take action and yes sometimes we need to sacrifice certain things when 
when you were asked before about uh, whether you were a glass half full or a glass half, uh, half empty type type of person in relation to to, to climate and our, our probabilities of success, you said we have a glass. <laughs> um, how do you, which you know, meaning that we got so many challenges ahead of us? My goodness, how are we ever, we ever going to, going to, going to, going to win this, win this, this war, win this fight? Um, and the window of opportunity is closing so, so, so quickly on us. And um, what keeps you, you motivated? What keeps you, what, what gets, gets you out of bed and so fired up and passionate about, about making a change? The fact that yes, I can make a change. That's, uh, that's something which. Uh, uh, gets me up in the morning and that uh, we cannot give up on this fight. I mean, uh, there are a lot of things which are going wrong and I believe that we need to fight back. We cannot stay there and wait for somebody else to clean up this mess. I want to be part of those that clean up. I want to be part of changing things. So yes, that's what uh, gets me up in the morning. Okay, right. And what do you want your legacy as Green Party leaders to be? Well, I want the Green Party to grow and uh, evolve into something bigger, hopefully with more women involved, because there's a lack of women, especially across the board, but especially in the Green Party. And uh, I want the, the women to see me as their role model, hopefully inspiring them to take up politics. It's not something for the boys, just go ahead and do it. And what gives you hope for the future? The fact that the young generation is more ecologically minded, the fact that they actually understand that we have a problem, they're not ignoring it. They know that we have a problem with the climate, they know that we have the, our air quality is very poor, and that gives me hope. And they're speaking about it, that they want politicians to act on it, and uh, that is something which gives me a lot of courage to go on. Fantastic. And we just finish up. We normally ask, we ask everyone uh, for a little piece of advice at the end as a, as a, as a little closing question. And if I could ask you in your capacity as Green Leader, someone who has taken a very big and bold step. So a few, few years ago, you decided, no, I've had enough. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to, going to stand up, I'm going to be counted, got involved in politics, and you're now le le leader of a party looking for European elections. If there's somebody else out there who's sitting around, who's, li who's listening, who's t taking inspiration um, and wants to go and get involved and wants to try and make a difference, or what advice would you give? Don't be afraid because there's a lot of fear out there. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's time to uh, take your future in your own hands and fight for it and work for it. There is uh, room for growth. There, there is, this is the time to bring change into this country. Let's move forward. Let's be forward thinking. Join us. Amazing. Fine. Thank you so much. That was Thank a, you. Yeah, lovely conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Very enjoyable. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.